Today we are going to look at some of the indigenous art from Oceana. Oceana is made up of 25,000 islands. Less than 1,500 are inhabited. It is believed that people migrated to this area 40,000 years ago from Asia. This early human migration was achieved when a landmass, the Sail continent, connected the island of New Guinea, the areas with a land bridge. From this area near Papua New Guinea and Australia, more of the indigenous people would spread out to farther islands, using their knowledge to travel large expanses of water. Because the migration covered a large area, the languages will greatly vary from island to island. Our first look is going to be at New Caledonia. The appearance of Lapita pottery in New Caledonia is a reflection of the migration that continued from Australia and New Guinea to the more western islands of Oceania. Lapita pottery features intricate, repeating geometric patterns. It will occasionally feature faces. Designs are applied while the clay is still wet. These vessels are typically used for cooking, storing, and serving food. Next, we take a look at Papua New Guinea. In New Guinea, inhabitants speak over 800 different languages. The Ayodhul people lived in the northern part of Papua New Guinea. These communities are based upon kinship, and they include extended families as well as different clans. The Meeting House reinforces kinship links by serving as the locale for initiation of use into the rank for men's discussions of community issues and for ceremonies linked to the Aymatul's ancestors. Access to these ceremonial houses is limited to men. Women and uninitiated boys are denied access to this. In this manner, access of knowledge and therefore power is controlled. The gable ends of such houses are usually covered and include a giant female gable mask. Carved images of clan ancestors were placed on the five central ridge posts and the 12 roof support posts on both sides of the house. At the top of the house are two raised spires at each end. This house is monumental in its scale, dwarfing the family houses. Ayatmul men's houses are the most lavishly decorated of such structures in Papua New Guinea. Nearby, in the hilly regions north of the Sepik River, we are going to look at the Ablam peoples. The Ablam people were agriculturalists, and their main cultivar is the yam. Yams were not only important for growing and eating, but it became a central part of their spiritual beliefs. Status was determined by their success in growing long yams. Long yams were used for ceremonial purposes, while they grew smaller yams for eating. Only initiated men who observe strict rules of conduct can work in these fields. The Aplum believe that ancestors aid in the growth of yams and they hold ceremonies to honor their ancestors. Yam masks are an important part of these ceremonies. The yam masks were not worn by the people, but the yams themselves during these ceremonies. They are made from cane or wood frames and are usually painted red, white, yellow, and black. They also incorporate sculpted faces, feathers, and shell ornaments onto the mask. Next, we look at the Alama people of Orokolo Bay and their hibihi, an elaborate cycle of ceremonial activities. They believe that during this time, there will be a visitation of water spirits. The cycle includes the production and presentation of large ornate masks, also called the hibihi. Primarily organized by the male elders of the village, the cycle was a communal undertaking and normally took anywhere from 10 to 20 years to complete. The cycle finished in a display of the finished Hivihi mass. Each mass was constructed of painted bark cloth wrapped around a cane and wood frame that fit over the wearer's body. The mass normally were 10 to 12 feet in height, although extensions could be added, stretching that height to as much as 25 feet. These masks required great skill to construct and only trained men could participate in the mass making. Designs were specific to their clans, passed down by eldermen from memory. Each mask represented a female sea spirit. They often incorporated designs from local flora and fauna. 
The final stage of the cycle focused on the dramatic appearance of the mass from the Aravo, or the men's house. After the ceremonies, the mass were killed and dumped in piles and burned. This destruction allowed the sea spirits to return to their domain and provided a reason for commencing the cycle again. The Tropian Islanders were well known for Kula, an exchange of white shell ornaments for red shell necklaces. These islanders were very isolated due to their island existence. They had to undertake potentially dangerous voyages to participate in this trading. They put a great deal of effort into decorating their large canoes. They carved them with ornate prows and splashboards. They are covered in the knowledge and symbolism of the Kula images. Human, bird, and serpent motifs are all references to sea spirits, ancestors, and totemic animals. These motifs are highly stylized, making specific identification difficult. Let's shift from looking at Papua New Guinea to Micronesia. Palau in the Caroline Islands have elaborately painted men's ceremonial clubhouses called bai. These bai have steep roofs decorated with geometric patterns along the roof boards. These decorated areas illustrate important historical events. Palau artists carve the gable in low relief and paint it with narrative scenes and myths related to the clan who built the bai. While the Ayat Mole also had ceremonial houses, the Balao make the main structure of the bai of wood that is worked, fitted, joined, and pegged together. Let's take a look at Polynesia. This is going to include a large area of Oceania from the Cook Islands up to Hawaii. While a lot of the forms of art we have looked at have been crafted by men, let's take a look at one that is done just by the women. Women throughout Polynesia traditionally produced decorated bark cloth using the inner bark of the mulberry tree. The finished product goes by several names depending on which island you are at. But for our purposes, we'll use the one most commonly used towards the end of the 19th century, tapa. Tapa was utilized extensively for clothing and bedding. Tapa used for everyday clothing was normally unadorned, whereas tapa used for ceremonial or ritual purposes was dyed, painted, stenciled, and sometimes even perfumed. The designs applied to the tapa differed depending on the particular island group producing it and the function of the cloth. The residents of Rarotonga used various types of carved deity figures. These included carved wooden fishermen's gods, large naturalistic deity images, and at least three types of staff gods, also called district gods. One of the best preserved examples of this is close to four feet high and consists of one long piece of wood carved at both the top and the bottom. The long central section is wrapped with decorated bark cloth. The carving on the top depicts a figure with smaller alternating female and male figures projecting from the front of his body. The exact meanings of all of these figures has been lost to history. We'll talk about more of that cause at the end of the video. An important art form for the Marquesa Islands was their tattoos. It served as a form of spiritual armor. Polynesians developed the painful but prestigious art of tattoo more fully than any other oceanic people. Various tattoo patterns subdivide the body part into zones on both sides down the middle. Some tattoos accentuate joint areas, whereas others separate muscle masses into horizontal and vertical geometric shapes. The warrior also covered his face, hands, and feet with tattoos. In what is now known as Hawaii, social structure was crucial to social stability most of the material culture produced in Hawaii was intended to visualize and reinforce hierarchy. Chiefly regalia was a prominent part of artistic production. Feather cloaks were created for chiefly men of high rank. The materials were exceedingly precious, particularly the red and yellow feathers. The birds relied on for these feathers typically yielded only six or seven suitable feathers and given that a full-length cloak could require 500,000 feathers, the resources and labor required to produce a cloak were extraordinary. Not only did these cloaks offer protection of the gods to the wearers, 
but their dense fiber base and feather matting also provided physical protection. Our next look is probably one of the most recognizable of the Oceanic Arts. We're headed to Rapa Nui, better known to us as Easter Island. All of the objects that we have looked at before have been biodegradable, designed for a short-term use and are typically small in scale. The moai, or stone sculptures, found on the island of Rapa Nui, these sculptures are monumental in scale. Some soaring to a height of up to 40 feet, stand as silent guardians on stone platforms. These platforms marked burial sites or were used for religious ceremonies. Archaeological surveys have documented close to 900 moai quarried at one volcanic site on the island. Most of the moai are carved from soft volcanic tuff. After quarrying, the statues were dragged to the particular site and positioned vertically. Each statue weighs up to 100 tons. According to one scholar, it would have taken 30 men one year to carve the moai, 90 men two months to move it from the quarry, and 90 men three months to position it vertically on the platform. Moving from Polynesia, we'll now head to New Zealand. As in other cultures, ancestors play an important role in New Zealand. The Maori Meeting House demonstrates the importance of ancestral connections. The Maori conceptualized the entire building as the body of an ancestor. The central beam across the roof is the spine, the rafters are the ridge, and the barge boards, the angle boards that outline the house, in front represent the arms. On the inside of the meeting house, ancestors show their presence through their appearance on the, the relief panels along the walls. These panels depict specific ancestors and are often carved in a style that has come to characterize Maori art. Virtually every surface of the meeting house is decorated. Our last stop in Oceania is Australia. Aborigines had a special relationship with the land they lived on, developed because of their hunting and gathering lifestyle. Because of this deep-rooted connection with the environment, the Aboriginal way of thinking and their view of the world centered on a concept known as dreamings. Dreamings are ancestral beings whose spirits are still felt in the present. All Aborigines identify certain dreamings as important ancestors and those who share the same dreamings are socially linked. Because they were hunter and gatherers, Aboriginal art is relatively small and portable. Bark painting became an important part of Aboriginal art. Bark was widely available as well as easy to carry and lightweight. The elongated figure represented in a style referred to as X-ray, which is used to depict both animals and humans. The artist is showing both the interior, the internal organs, and the exterior, the outside of the body. For thousands of years, these islands in Oceania remain undiscovered from the outside world. In 1521, Magellan's fleet from Spain arrived, changing the lifestyles and rituals and customs of this area of the world forever. Many of the explorers from Western European countries would eventually claim these islands as their territories introducing their own cultures and suppressing or erasing the cultures of the natives that already lived there.